Oh my Lord, breathe on me, touch my eyes and make me see. Well, this might be one of the most foundational messages I'll ever give in this church. I've probably given more exciting messages in the past, but this is probably one of the most foundational. And there are times when I wonder, Lord, why do you have me give these really foundational, important messages for the whole flock on Sundays when it has snowed or, you know, things like that. But I give them when he says to give them. So Jesus, I'm asking that you fill this. I'm asking God that you insert something into us that breaks, I'm, I'm just gonna say breaks demonic lies, that injects into us an element of your heart, God, that is at the core of who you are and who you've called us to be. Thank you, Lord. I may get really personal about some of this. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But here's where we start. Every nation and every people that has ever existed has had a culture. Culture governs what we do, who we are. It's customs and traditions and ways of thinking and doing things that have meaning and power. They, they, they shape entire people groups. You know, as you were raised in a culture, so you learned. We just, just, uh, we just came through a season, Christmas, where we were all immersed in, in a culture that has traditions, ways of doing things, that have meaning, teach us something about life, everything from giving each other gifts to Christmas trees and Santa Claus and even Black Friday. What a name. That sounds like something that's, you know, demonic. I don't know what it is, but <laughs> Black Friday. Anyway. And so when you read the Bible, so much of the Bible is, matter of fact, all of the Bible is steeped in the culture of the people who lived in those stories in history so long ago. God loves culture. And so in the Bible, he spoke through culture, and he used language, and he used symbols from the culture that the people of the culture understood. And some of that culture is 4,000 years old, and it no longer exists. And it was a culture that was very different than the culture you and I live in. And so there's this tendency, I think, to miss the heart of what God was doing and saying in those Bible stories that we read. But the meaning of what he did in that culture remains. It stands for eternity. The ways and the, uh, the, and, and the customs of that culture might have died out long ago, but the truth that God communicated through them stands for eternity. Now, Today in the church, I've heard a lot of culture talk. I've heard a lot of language tossed around that while it may be true, it tends to lose its meaning over time because it misses an essential foundation that I'm gonna talk about today. It misses the eternal truth that's embedded in the most ancient cultural traditions and the ceremonies in the Bible. And the issue that I wanna to raise today is covenant. Covenant. And I want to introduce a phrase that I haven't heard anybody else use anywhere else. We need a culture of covenant. A culture of covenant. In ancient Bible times, there were procedures, there were traditions that were involved. And if you're going to establish a culture, I mean, I'm sorry, if you're going to establish a covenant, there were, there were procedures, there were traditions ceremonies that have been lost to us that define what covenant means. And so in Genesis 15, this is just some ancient, I'm, I'm gonna mess with you later. In Genesis 15, God had already reached out to Abraham. He'd already called him to leave his father's country and go into a land that he would show him. He'd already prospered him and multiplied his flocks. He'd already chosen him but the covenant that God was about to make was a whole lot more than any of that had already been. For Abraham, his name was still Abram, and it was time for Abram to take a step up. It was time for a destiny that had been appointed for him to begin to unfold. 
It was time for favor to really be launched. And so God came to Abram, who was not yet Abraham, in a vision, and he began to make promises. God was about to make a covenant with Abraham, and that began with promises and with commitments. Covenants begin with promises and commitments. Genesis 15, verse one. God said to Abram, this is the first of the covenant commitments, I am a shield to you. I'm gonna protect you. Your safety counts. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Abram answers in verse two, what will you give me since I am childless? Childlessness was an important issue then because a man felt cursed if he didn't have children. So you're gonna bless me. You're gonna make me very great. You're gonna shield me. Well, how are you gonna prove it? What are you gonna show me since I don't have a child? In verse four, God promised him a son. It's another covenant commitment. Way important in ancient times. And then he said in verse five, now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you were able to count them. <laughs> That's a little foreign to us too, isn't it? I remember when I was a kid, I could still go out and lie under the stars and just get lost in them because I could see them. Try go lying in your dark, you know, try, try, try at night, go lie in your backyard and see if you can see any stars anymore. <laughs> Look toward the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to them, so shall your descendants be. And then the promise got bigger in verse seven. In the promise of land. I'm gonna give you this land and it was huge. All the way to what we now call Iraq. And he said, oh Lord, how may I know that I will possess it? God's making covenant promises. Abram wants to know, how will I know? And so the answer was that God, and I want you to follow this language, God cut a covenant with Abraham. Cut a covenant is very specific language. Cut a covenant, because animals were cut and blood was shed. It was part of the ceremony that established the covenant. It was a blood covenant. Christians talk a lot about blood covenant. We don't have one freaking clue what's really meant by blood covenant. Blood covenant. You gotta understand, blood covenant is the thread that holds the whole Bible together. It's the heart of the gospel. It's everything. It's the whole thing. It's the heart of the story of salvation. So when a blood covenant was established, there were these ceremonies and customs. Blood covenant was like, it was like a contract that bestowed blessings, it bestowed rights, it bestowed privileges, but it also came with obligations and with penalties if that blood covenant was violated or broken. Do you follow me? The first step in a blood covenant is that one person has to be the initiator, has to ask for it. Abraham asked God for a firm and clear guarantee that God would do what he promised. And God responded by initiating this ceremony of what, it, of, we, of what you might call the blood brother covenant. Genesis 15, verse nine. So he said to him, God said to Abraham, bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old ram, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him, and he cut them in two. And he laid each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. In other words, what he's done is he's taken the animals, and he has cut them down the middle, and he splayed them out with a space, a passageway in between. He cut them in two, slew the animals and cut them in two because entering a blood covenant is a promise unto death for each partner to the covenant. It's symbolized by the sacrifice of the animals. It was a way of, of calling death down on yourself if you would violate the covenant. Now listen carefully because I'm working up to messing with you. It was a binding of their two lives together. It was an exchange of life, one life for the other life. And so now if you're in a blood covenant, whatever I have is at your disposal and whatever you have is at my disposal. We are, we're, we're in a blood covenant, we are now bound together as family. That's what it meant. 
I'm not giving you even all the details of this. It was a detailed thing. We're bound together as family. Your children are my children. My children are your children. Your welfare is my welfare. My welfare is your welfare. And to symbolize that exchange, they would pass between the two halves of the animal, passing one another in like a figure eight, changing places. Because they're exchanging life. And so God himself, listen to me, God himself passed between the pieces of the sacrificial animals. Verse 17, it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark and behold there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between the pieces. God is making a blood covenant. Verse 18, on that day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying to your descendants I have given this land. So God's first covenant promise, his first covenant commitment was to bless Abraham with the land, the promised land. Partners to the covenant would each make promises. There'd be commitments. There'd be commitments made to the life that they would live together. They would point to the sacrificial animals and they would say, may God do so, those dead animals now. They would point to them and they'd say, may God do so to me and more if I ever break or violate the covenant that we make today. Beginning to get how serious this is? And so God promised a son to Abraham. And he promised uncountable descendants. He promised them land to occupy. But it goes further even than that. Blood covenants were made with blessings and with curses. The blessing was that each partner to the covenant would have have access to all the assets of the other whenever it was needed. If one of them was in trouble, the other would be there. They would stand together in the face of everything. That was the blessing. To fail in that commitment was to bring down a curse. Example, Jeremiah 34. This is much later than the covenant to Abraham, but the custom still held. And what had happened there was that the kings and the rulers in Judah had been disobedient to a clear command of the Lord to set their servants free. In other words, if you you paid a debt, you could sell yourself into slavery. And in the seventh year, the, the, the one that you'd sold yourself to to pay your debt was commanded to set you free. They had violated their covenant with God to set their slaves free. And they had established that covenant by passing between the cut halves of the sacrificial animal. Listen, I'll read it. Jeremiah 34, 18. I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant who have not fulfilled the words of the covenant which they made before me when they cut the calf in two and passed between its parts. The officials of Judah and the officials of Jerusalem, the court officers and the priests and all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf, I will give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their life. And their dead bodies will be food for the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth. And it's exactly what happened when Babylon came and raised Jerusalem to the ground. Blood covenant carries with it certain obligations on the part of both parties. Blessing comes with fulfilling the covenant obligations. Failure to fulfill those obligations brings down the curse. And it comes down in the form of of, of inability to get victory over enemies and over obstacles. Are you bothered yet? <laughs> Blood covenant would involve an exchange of weapons. You're binding your households together. And so you would exchange weapons, which was a promise that if you faced an enemy or if you suffered an injustice, you had every right to call on the full resources of your blood covenant partner to come and, and help you in that fight. And that partner would come. So the first thing to understand is God has bound himself to us in blood covenant. He did it first through Abraham, and then he did it by the blood of Jesus. The covenant with Abraham was a blood covenant. The blood of Jesus is a blood covenant. He will come. He will defend us. He is our mighty fortress. He is our deliverer. That's all covenant language. All that is, all, in this covenant, all that's God's is ours. And all that's ours is God's. And when we enter into that covenant with him, 
That's what becomes true. Under blood covenant, we have the covenant right, listen to me, we have the covenant right to petition heaven for justice. We have the covenant right for him to come to our aid. We have the covenant right to access the full might of our God to come, to come against any enemy who unjustly opposes because it's a blood covenant initiated through the broken body of Jesus. But that covenant, and this is what's really important, it exists not just between God and us. When we, come, when, we, when we become part of the body of Christ, we become party to the covenant that he has with his people because he did it for us collectively, not just for a gang of individuals. You didn't get individually saved. You entered into a covenant body. And so the terms of the blood covenant become binding on us in our relationships with each other. 2 Timothy 3, you read the Apostle Paul. By the way, you, you, you start reading the New Testament through a filter of covenant and you will see it laced through there. 2 Timothy 3 verse 2, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, Brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they, a form of godliness, although they denied its power. That's a list of things that are the opposite of the promises made in a blood covenant after the biblical model. And the penalty is even written into it, if, if the curse for breaking that covenant. If we break our covenant with each other, then we violate our covenant with God. And if we do that, then we forfeit covenant protections in these last days. And the penalty is they have denied its power. What does that mean? Think miracles diminished. Think fewer lives saved. Think increased struggles when, when you face obstacles. Think loss of joy. Think dryness in worship. In the Blood Brother Covenant, there was a name change as each party adopted the other as family. There was actually a name change. So you took on part of your covenant partner's name and your partner took part of yours. And so in Genesis 17, 5, Abram's name is changed to Abraham, Abraham, because what happened was they inserted one syllable of God's name into Abram's name. Yah, Abraham. The same way his wife Sarah becomes Sarah, again inserting a syllable from God's name, Yah, into her name. There's an exchange of names. When you and I become, when you and I take part, of, when we become Christians, when we really, when we're brought into this blood covenant, we take a part of Jesus' own name. He's Messiah, Mashiach in the Hebrew. When we use the name Christian, that's the way the Greeks translated Mashiach. Christos in the Greek. So we're Christian. We've now taken his name. There's an exchange of names. And that means there's a new identity in this, in this blood covenant. Every blood, and here's the next, every blood covenant ended with a covenant meal to celebrate the union and to remember the promises that were the centerpiece of the covenant. Now again, I've said blood covenant is the thread that unites the whole Bible. Blood covenant is what bonds the people of God to one another in love. We celebrate, now listen, remember, every covenant, every covenant ceremony ends with a meal to celebrate the terms of the covenant, right? We have communion. That's what that is. It's a covenant meal. We dedicate the elements of communion. We quote Jesus. What did he say? Matthew 26, 27, 28. When he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant. Luke twenty two twenty, 20. 
In the same way he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Blood covenant. Every time that we take communion, it's the covenant meal. That's where we, we declare, we celebrate that we have a blood covenant with God and we have it with one another. It should be a time for reaffirming our promises and our oaths before God as well as remembering his promises and oaths to us. That's why the apostle, listen, because this is something we do together because we're bound in that same covenant. If it's a covenant with him, it's a covenant with one another. That's why the apostle Paul got so upset with the Corinthian church over the way they celebrated communion. First Corinthians, listen to this, 11, verse 18. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. Those were covenant violations where connection with one another in the blood covenant was missed. Paul basically called it an abomination. All of that's to bring us to this point. I hear a lot of talk in the body of Christ today about a culture of honor. I've seen the culture of honor work for a while. For a while. And then I've seen it fail. Sometimes the ones who preach it the loudest are the ones who fail at it the worst. I've seen it fail because the essential foundation is missing. Sometimes the worst violators of the culture of honor are the ones who are the most enthusiastic promoters of it. Culture of honor has to be built on a foundation of a culture of covenant connection. It has to be built on a foundation of that sacrifice or it will fail. A covenant, it has to be a covenant made and built on biblical terms. For a lot of years, we've talked and we've taught about the Father's heart. and we've, we've wanted a culture of the Father's heart in the church. But after a while, all that talk just seems to devolve into just a lot of words because it's missing the essential foundation that you find in that ancient culture in the Bible. See, the Father's heart is the heart of covenant. He's a covenant God. And he calls us to share that covenant among ourselves in him. And because he's a covenant God, Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's included in the covenant bond. It's included in the blood covenant commitments. It's the commitment he made to us, but blood covenant commitments are always two-sided. They're always about both parties. We're called to be bonded with one another in the same way. We're, we're called to be bonded with one another with covenant bonds because Jesus cut the covenant with us. It's a thread that binds most of the New Testament together and makes it one word and one message. And if you violate the terms of that covenant, curses come down. John 17, Jesus' last prayer. Verse 21, that they may all be one. That's covenant language. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you've given me, I've given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. There's another portion of scripture I was gonna look it up and include it. I'm terrible at addresses, but it says, he who destroys the body, I will destroy. That's a covenant penalty. Philippians 2, verse 3. This is covenant language. Listen. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. That's what happens when you enter into covenant do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's what the covenant commitment is. Our lives are bound together. Now your life is more important than mine. That's the exchange of life. 
Remember the exchange of weapons for mutual defense. Your life is now my life. Your family is now my family. I don't believe that we will ever see a lasting revival. I don't believe we will see the end time outpouring of the Holy Spirit until and unless we develop a culture of covenant to undergird it. And we've had anything but that in the church in America. Not even close. Culture of covenant. That's an attitude, that's an atmosphere of attitude and practice and and, and commitment to one another that teaches everyone in it to live in a sacrificial, unself-centered way. In a culture of covenant, each individual exists for the benefit of the whole, and the whole exists to benefit and strengthen the individual. Covenant, it's it's a commitment to one another because of, of our commitment to Jesus that cannot be broken. Covenant with Abraham, you know, the split animal and and the smoking pot, that meant God would give everything for Abraham and nothing would turn him away from doing that. And when you look at it, God made, God entered into that covenant with Abraham. Abraham was a failure on so many fronts. So many fronts and God stood by him because that's what covenant does. He failed on so, in so many ways. Gave his wife into a a king's harem to protect his own skin. Go read the the scripture. I mean, he got tired of waiting for the promised son, so he went into his wife's maid, Hagar, and fathered an illegitimate child. But he never let go of God. God. Because that was Abraham's side of the covenant commitment. And God would never let go of him. And then Jesus gave his life for that covenant. Ephesians 4, start at verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. There's the two sides of the covenant commitment. God has forgiven you, you forgive. It's covenant language. That's the bond not broken no matter what. It's what Jesus gave us. It's part of what he died to give us. It's what we give one another in a culture of covenant. So there's nothing we don't forgive. There's nothing to which we grant the power to drive us away from one another, ever. That's what blood covenant means. Covenant covenant implications are there in the spiritual gifts. Listen listen to how this is written. I've, I've been around... I've been around long enough to live through the charismatic renewal when spiritual gifts were all about, oh, you got a great gift, that makes you important and gives you a place. That is not what scripture says. Not even close. 1 Corinthians 12, 7, to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. That's covenant language. So that there may be no division in the body but that the members may have the same care for one another. Remember, your family is my family. My family is your family. That's covenant. That's what the blood covenant means. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Why? Because it's our life together. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. In a culture of covenant, I'm not a prophet to build my own empire. I'm not a prophet to build my big ministry or benefit myself. People, if that were true, I wouldn't still be pastoring a small church in North Denver that suffered a heartbreaking split last year. I'd be somewhere else. I'd be somewhere building a following and fame and glory for my own pleasure and I could do it. I'd be avoiding the pain and suffering of of commitment to a very difficult city like Denver. Where to be really personal, I've been slandered and accused and put down, accused of things I didn't do, talked about, lied about. 
That could be somewhere else. That I have a covenant with you. You matter more to me than my own life. And I won't betray that. Every word, every touch in ministry, every blessing, every forgiveness of an offense or a wound is for the benefit of my tribe. It's for my covenant people. What I have belongs to them. Lately, it's been difficult. This is where I'll get personal. It's been difficult because I'm not doing well physically. Physically, I'm at the breaking point. The headaches have been so intense, I can hardly think. You know what happens when the enemy gets working? It's all I can do to pull a Sunday morning together and get past the deep, deep fatigue from the daily pain that is going on. I'll walk past somebody and I don't notice them. And then they're angry. I forget to say something. And then the condemnation comes down because the enemy's at work. But in, in a covenant walk, you don't do that. In a covenant walk, we have each other's backs. In a covenant walk, we have each other's hearts. We need a culture of covenant or there won't be a big, sweeping, lasting revival in America. I've seen them all come and go. And what we get is the stuff that's up here. Oh, the move of the Spirit. Oh, the prophetic. Oh, the five-fold ministry. Oh, the culture of honor. But we don't get covenant, and so it never lasts. Because it has no foundation on which to rest. And all across America, we're violating covenant. We're violating blood covenant. And then wonder why we have no voice in America anymore. That's the hard word. You know, if you have a gift of healing, that's not so that you have a place or position. It's not so you have a place of being recognized. It's not about you. Your gift belongs to your covenant people. It's for them. It's that what you have belongs to the family. That's covenant culture. Those people are now more important than your own needs. And they now are called to regard you as more important than their own needs. If you're a teacher, that's not to advance your cause or establish your authority or amaze people with your insights. It's for the building up of the people that, that, that you've come into the covenant with through Jesus. You know, Americans come to church to be fed. God, I'm sick of that. Come to church to be fed. Too many churches cater to that. We tend to come as consumers seeking entertainment or a product, and too many cater to that. We tend to come to church as a bunch of isolated individuals who don't have any consciousness at all of the impact of our own lives and our own actions on others, and you hear very little teaching about our interconnectedness. Your best life is just before you. That's not the gospel. You know, the things that matter to the average American Christian revolve around what each of us feels emotionally and how we want to be made to feel. And we do the same things that I'm talking about. We do the same things in this nation to our marriages, and you don't have to be a prophet to see that it isn't working. You know, a marriage covenant is a commitment to sacrifice my life for my mate. It's not about getting my needs met. It's not about being blessed by my wife. It's not about her making me happy. I tell every young couple that I do a wedding ceremony for that this is not the person that you've chosen to make you happy. That's a formula for failure that you're done before you start. This is the person you've chosen to lay your life down for until the day one of you dies. When I first moved to Denver back in, when was that? 
<laughs> lost track of the years. We moved to Denver, I think, in uh, 1991. I came to be the executive pastor of a very large church. And they were into doing these psychological tests to find out how everybody fit together. And the test that they made us take was called the MBTI. And uh, when the results came back, Beth and I were such opposites that the tester said, you two shouldn't even be together. <laughs> but obviously you've worked out the issues. And I said, what issues? But it was true, I was the hippie. She was the nerd, still is. We didn't like the same music. I was playing Purple Haze and she'd been singing Sweet Alice Blue Gown with her mother all of her life. 47 years later, I still can't teach her rhythm. Our personalities are diametric opposites. We watched Porky's and I laughed until my sides hurt and tears ran down my face. And she said, it's not funny, hubby, it's not funny. We go to Estes Park and I jaywalk and then wait on the other side of the street while she goes to the corner and waits for the light. <laughs> because she won't break the rules. <laughs> and on and on it goes. Yeah, you, we've got a witness to that, don't we? <laughs> but, you know, we've been happily married for 47 years, and it's not because we're so compatible. It's not, because, it's not because we always met one another's needs or always said the right thing. It's not because we never had a problem. It's because of blood covenant. I'll insert this too. I hadn't planned it. How many of you know that a woman's, uh, that a virgin's hymen has no function? No practical function except to break and bleed. You know why? You know why God put that there? Because marriage is a blood covenant. And so Beth is more important to me than me. My wife is more important to me than me. And I'm more important to her than her. And we act on it. Amen. And I'll tell you what, when you do that, something that you can call real love grows. And real joy and real peace. And it's a thing that can never be threatened. More important to me, more important to me is how I affect her than how she affects me. That's what happens when you pass through the halves of the blood sacrifice in the figure eight and exchange places. Blood covenant is an exchange of life. And what matters is how my actions affect you, my family, and you whom I would defend with my life because that's what the covenant means. I've been betrayed by a lot of people through the years. And anybody that's known me all that time knows that if I get a call from somebody who cut my heart out and they said, come, please pray for me, I'm in the hospital and dying, I will go in a heartbeat. Because I won't break the blood covenant. That's what covenant people do. Jesus defended us with his life while we were yet sinners. That's what covenant people do. Philippians 2, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. We have passed in a figure eight between the halves of the, of, of the sacrifice in Jesus' body and blood. We've exchanged places with one another and with our Savior through the body of Jesus, through his blood that does more than cleanse us from sin. If that's where you stopped, you missed it. His blood is covenant blood. And it bonds us not just to him, but to one another. This cup that we share in communion is the new covenant in my blood. 
For lack of a foundation in covenant, the church fails and lives are destroyed. This year, just about to pass, has been a difficult one for a lot of people. I have connections all over the nation and the world and people have messaged me and they've called me and they've told me the stories about the hurts and the disappointments and the disasters and the broken relationships because we've not really grasped as a culture the foundational importance of a culture of covenant. When that happens, most people just isolate. I watch it happen all the time. Get hurt, I isolate. Cut off from people. And what happens in isolation is their situations and their unhappiness becomes worse because God never designed us to work that way. He didn't make it like that. Somebody asked me the other day, because they were, they were looking at that tendency for people to isolate when things get tough, and they asked me, you know, what, what's the root of that? And I answered, we have no understanding in this culture of what covenant means. We're steeped in consumerism. We got this focus on self. We worship our emotions and what we feel and to hell with what anybody else feels because it's my feelings that matter. Culture of covenant and culture of self are diametrically opposed to one another. They cannot exist in the same space. One cancels the other. One edifies and strengthens. The other weakens and destroys. We go to the book of Hebrews. Book of, you know, read the book of Hebrews. It's all about the better covenant that we have in Jesus. The whole book is about a better covenant that we have in Jesus. And it leads to this. This is Hebrews 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now don't take that as an isolated statement. It's connected with covenant. Listen to where it goes. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You want to read that carefully. You can't maintain unwavering hope without commitment to a culture of covenant connection with God's people based in the better covenant that Jesus gave us. You all got that, right? <laughs> you can't maintain unwavering hope without commitment to a culture of covenant connection with God's people based in the better covenant that Jesus gave us. A culture of covenant encourages, it uplifts, it stands with, it practices presence for one another, it leads us to grow in doing great things, it's a sharing of life, it's a sacrifice for one another, and so you don't isolate, you don't forsake the gathering, because in the gathering you give yourself for the sake of others to encourage them, lift them, and stimulate them to a better life. And I tell you what, there's no better remedy for depression than going out and giving yourself away to somebody. <laughs> when you do that, it feeds your own joy, it feeds your own strength. Because now you matter to somebody else. That's how covenant life works. Without a foundation in covenant, the culture of honor has no meaning. It's just words. I don't want to hear it anymore. Without covenant, it's just words. Without a foundation in covenant culture, the Father's heart will mean only that Father God loves me, 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 and it won't drive me to love you with his heart. Because that's where covenant takes us. And that's how God designed the world to work. You can try to make it work some other way, but you might as well try to fly by flapping your elbows. <laughs> Remember, Gertrude and Heathcliff? <laughs> okay, some of you laugh because you're dated. You're old, like me. Red Skelton, remember that? Hey, Gertrude and Heathcliff. <laughs> You can flap your elbows all day, you're not gonna fly. I wanna see, I wanna, I wanna see a culture of covenant grow among us this year powered by the covenant Jesus cut with us on the cross. Let love abound, let it be real, and let lives be changed. 
I look around this room and I, I know a lot of you felt betrayed last year. And I want to say, feel it and get over it. A lot of you felt betrayed last year. And trust me, there's nobody in this room felt more betrayed than I did. Get over it. Feel it and get over it. And get on with the covenant that God has given you with these people. With these brothers and sisters. And let's see the kingdom of God manifest in this place. And if we, can be, if we can establish a real culture of covenant in this place, we might stand a chance of being a light to the nations. And a real culture of honor might manifest here. And some real lives might be changed. So God, I'm praying. Lord, I see your broken body on that cross. that covenant in blood. And Lord, I pray that it becomes real in our hearts. I pray, Lord, that we really get converted. And I bless this next year to be the most glorious we've ever had. Oh, my Lord. Breathe on me, touch my eyes and make me see. Wake me, Lord, from my sleep.